Hi, I'm Pastor Kerry. Before we get started, there are a few things I want to encourage you to have on hand. First, I want to encourage you to have a set of the sermon notes. If you don't already have them, you can go to the link that's right down below the video. It'll take you to a place where you can print a set of the sermon notes for yourself. I also want to encourage you to have some communion elements. You'll want to have some bread or a cracker. You'll want to have some juice or some wine. If you don't have juice or wine, probably any beverage would suffice. But you'll want to have those communion elements because here in about 20 minutes, when we get to the end of the sermon, we'll move right into a time of communion with you. So if you need any of those things, I would encourage you to pause the video. Grab whatever you need once everything is ready, then go ahead and resume the playback. So I'm guessing that you are familiar with the story of Jonah from the Old Testament. Jonah is one of the best known people in the entire Bible because, of course, we know the story of Jonah and the whale, or Jonah and the great fish. We know that Jonah was swallowed, and if you know the story pretty well, you know that he spent three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, according to the Old Testament. But what a lot of people don't necessarily remember is what happened before <laughs> the great fish swallowed Jonah or what happened after the great fish swallowed Jonah. And it just so happens that the lectionary Old Testament reading for this coming Sunday for September 24th of 2023 talks about what happened after Jonah had been swallowed by the great fish and spit back up onto dry land. So what I want to do before we jump into the lectionary reading for this Sunday is I want us to just quickly review what got us to this point in the first place because it's important for this passage we're going to be taking a look at today. Now, Jonah was a prophet in the Old Testament and it tells us that God spoke to Jonah and said, Jonah, I want you to go to the city of Nineveh and I want you to preach repentance to them because I am at my wit's end with the city of Nineveh. I am just about out of patience and they either need to repent of their evil ways or I'm going to destroy the city. That's what God says to Jonah. And how does Jonah respond? Well, the book of Jonah, chapter 1, tells us that he <laughs> went the opposite direction. Did he head for Nineveh? No, quite the opposite. It doesn't necessarily give us any explanation. It just tells us that Jonah split and he was headed for Tarshish. Now, what we know about Tarshish is that it could be talking about a number of different places, but regardless of which particular Tarshish Jonah was heading for, the point is he was getting as far away from Nineveh as he possibly could. Now, in Nineveh, they were, of course, not Jewish people. They were Gentiles. And we know that as a general rule in the Old Testament, uh, the Hebrew people were not big fans of the Gentiles. And so the logical assumption might be the reason that Jonah didn't want to go and preach repentance to the great city of Nineveh was because maybe he was afraid that the Ninevites were going to take offense at this uh, message he was going to be bringing. Maybe they were going to uh, beat him up, put him to death, who knows? Those are all perfectly logical assumptions, but the book of Jonah, and at least in Jonah chapter 1, it doesn't tell us why Jonah heads the opposite direction. It just tells us that he does. Now, you might remember this part of the story. Jonah goes and he hops on a ship, and he's heading for Tarshish, and after he hops on the ship, there's this huge storm that comes up. It's such a violent storm that everybody on board the ship all of a sudden starts to say, look, this is no normal storm. This is a supernatural storm. And they go and they find Jonah and they say, hey, Jonah, <laughs> is it possible that you've done something to offend your God? Because everybody else on the ship, they weren't Jewish. They weren't Hebrew either. But they say to Jonah, is it possible that you've done something to offend your God? Because there is nothing that is normal or natural about this storm. It seems like it's a supernatural storm, and it seems like we're all going to die. So is there something you need to tell us, Jonah? And Jonah says, yeah, uh, I am running away from my God, and that's probably why this storm has come up. And what you probably need to do is you probably just need to toss me overboard, and then you'll probably be safe. 
And the people on the ship say, whoa, 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 we, we're not saying that we want to throw you overboard. You're going to die if we throw you overboard. So let us try to keep battling the storm. And so they do. To their credit, these non-Jewish, these Gentile people on this ship, none of whom worshipped the one true God, they all tried to battle this storm. But after they try to battle the storm for a little while longer, they go back to Jonah and they say, Hey, Jonah, you remember what you told us a few minutes ago? You know what? We think we're going to have to take you up on that. We think that you are going to need to get tossed overboard. Otherwise, we are all going to die. And so Jonah says, That's fine. And they say, Hey, Jonah, please tell your God not to hold us responsible for this. See ya. <laughs> and they throw Jonah overboard. And so that is where the great fish comes into play because that is when Jonah is swallowed by the whale or by the great fish. And sure enough, Jonah was in the stomach of this great fish. It tells us for three days and three nights. And what's amazing to me, I mean, obviously this is a pretty amazing story to begin with, but one of the most amazing things to me is that it took Jonah three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish. I cannot imagine a more unpleasant place to be probably um, anywhere in, in this entire world. And it takes Jonah three days and three nights. He's that stubborn before he finally prays to God and says, God, maybe I should have listened to you. Uh, God, I know that you can deliver me from this situation. So God, please do so. And it is right at that moment that God causes the great fish to spit Jonah up onto dry ground. And it's at that point that Jonah goes to the city of Nineveh and he preaches repentance. And do they beat him up? Do they kill him? Do they take offense? No, quite the opposite. As a matter of fact, they listen to Jonah and they repent in sackcloth and ashes the whole nine yards. They repent to the point where God says, you know what, I accept your repentance, I forgive you, and God makes it clear, I am not going to destroy the city of Nineveh. Now, <laughs> that should be, that should be the end of the story. That should be the happy ending of the story, but it's not. Instead, we have Jonah chapter 4. And all of a sudden, in Jonah chapter 4, first of all, we're going to find out why Jonah ran in the first place. And second of all, we're going to find out that maybe Jonah isn't uh, the great hero that we would like for him to be. Obviously, all of the protagonists in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, we would like to think they're all fine, upstanding characters. But we're going to find out that perhaps Jonah is not the fine, upstanding character that we would have liked for him to be. So, uh, to quote Paul Harvey, and now the rest of the story, <laughs> the lectionary reading from the Old Testament for September 24th, 2023, Jonah chapter 4, and this is the passage in its entirety. After Jonah warned the Ninevites to turn from their evil ways, they sincerely repented. God forgave them, and Nineveh wasn't destroyed. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sin and calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, Jonah said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, 
Jonah, you've been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? And that's where the passage ends. And that's where the book of Jonah ends, right there. <laughs> if you were thinking, hey, you know what, Pastor Kerry, that seems like kind of an abrupt ending. Is there a Jonah chapter 5 or is there a Jonah chapter 4, verse 12 and verse 13? Uh, so that kind of wraps things up. No, <laughs> uh, that's exactly where it ends, is right where that passage stopped, which kind of makes it seem like the author of the book of Jonah is saying, time for you now, dear reader, to draw your own conclusions from this story. And so, hopefully, that is what we'll do together here over the next 10 minutes or so. We'll draw our own conclusions from the abrupt and the uh, kind of disturbing, kind of disappointing ending to the, the book of Jonah. What I want to do is what we always do. Let's go ahead and talk through the passage. Let's make sure that we understand everything that happened in this somewhat bizarre passage. And then after we talk through the passage, then we will draw some of those conclusions that I just referred to. So, like I said, at the start of the book of Jonah, when God says, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, and Jonah goes the opposite direction, we said that Jonah didn't give an explanation, and maybe it might have seemed like Jonah was afraid, but I guess, well, I guess he was afraid. He was afraid that he was going to go and preach repentance and that they would repent. And now we find out the reason that he didn't want to do that is he didn't want them to repent. Jonah wanted to see the city of Nineveh destroyed. Now, we have to remind ourselves that Jonah was, was a Hebrew. Hebrew people did not like non-Hebrew people. Non-Hebrew people, as a general rule, did not like Hebrew people. But Jonah... Uh, took it to the extreme, and he wanted to see the great city of Nineveh destroyed. And that wasn't what God wanted. Otherwise, God would not have sent Jonah to tell them to repent in the first place. So we jump in and said, and I find it so comical. I find it rather ironic that Jonah is saying, God, I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God. I know that you're slow to anger and abounding in love. A God who relents from sending calamity. Well, those are good things, right? Those are great things as far as you and I and Jonah and everybody else is concerned. Those are great things. The fact that God is gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. Those are beautiful things. And Jonah is angry about those things and saying, I knew that you would do this. I knew that you would not choose to forgive them. And so Jonah responds like a toddler who's having a temper tantrum and says, Now, Lord, take away my life, for it's better me to die than live. I just want to die. I'm so mad at you, God. <laughs> and so, like a good parent, uh, rather than saying, Jonah, you're behaving like a little brat. Go to your corner. Go to time out. Uh, instead, God asked Jonah an excellent question that a good parent should ask in an, an occasion like this. Jonah says, hey, Jonah, do you think that it's right for you to be angry about the fact that I have chosen to forgive the city of Nineveh? But by this time, Jonah's already stormed off. And it tells us that at this point, Jonah has set up uh, a little place for himself east of the city because Jonah at this point wants to sit and wants to watch and see and hope against hope that God is still going to destroy the city of Nineveh, which to me, again, is just mind-blowing. But that's how Jonah was feeling at that moment. So Jonah is set up a little ways east of the city, at a safe distance, I'm assuming. Jonah doesn't want to be in the line of fire when uh, the, the fire and the brimstone starts falling on the city of Nineveh. He's a safe distance away, but he's sitting there and he's watching. I think we can assume that Jonah probably popped himself a bowl of popcorn and he's eating his popcorn and he's watching to see what happens to the city of Nineveh. So at this point, God is going to uh, provide an object lesson to his petulant little prophet. And he 
allows this vine to grow up very quickly, and this vine provides some lovely shade for Jonah as he is sitting there staring to see what happens to the city of Nineveh. And then, overnight, God sends a worm that eats the vine, and the next day, when there's no vine to protect Jonah from the elements, God sends uh, a, a hot wind, and he allows the sun to beat down on Jonah. And Jonah, obviously, at this point, realizes what's going on, because God doesn't even have to say anything about, hey, Jonah, how are you doing today? Are you comfy there? As you're waiting and watching, hoping that I destroy the city of Nineveh, it, all it takes is the, the hot wind and the sun beating down, and Jonah just proclaims to God, it would be better for me to die than to live. Again, behaving like a spoiled child. And once again, God responds like a good parent would respond and says, Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And Jonah says, yes, it is. I'm so angry. I wish I were dead. <laughs> and so God now reasons with Jonah. And God says, so Jonah, let me see if I've got this straight. You are concerned about this plant that yesterday I grew for you. I caused the plant to grow, and then over the night, I caused the plant uh, to, to be worn away, to, to be eaten by that worm. And Jonah, just to be clear, you're concerned about that plant, but you're not concerned about 120,000 souls, much less their animals. <laughs> Jonah, even if you don't like people, you like animals, don't you? And so you are more concerned about that plant that I provided for you. You didn't grow that plant, Jonah. I grew that plant. And you're more concerned about the plant than 120,000 men and women and children and animals. Let me just make sure that I have that straight. And of course, that's where the book of Jonah ends. And so that's where you and I have to pick up the conversation. And so what I want to do now is let's very quickly, let's talk about three of the, the lessons that I think jump out at us, particularly from Jonah chapter 4. And the first lesson is this. God's will is always going to take priority over our wants. God's will, W-I-L-L, -L, is always going to take priority over our wants. W-A-N-T-S. Because what did Jonah want? Jonah wanted God to destroy the city of Nineveh, but that was not what God wanted, and understandably so. And friends, there are so many times in my life that I look back and I think about what I wanted at this point in my life, what I wanted at that point in my life. And as I look back now, I realize, you know what, it's probably good that I didn't get what I wanted at this point. It's probably good that I didn't get what I wanted at that point. Because the fact is, I can be pretty selfish at times. The fact is that sometimes what I want isn't good as far as the big picture is concerned. And I can honestly say I am glad that there have been plenty of times in my life when God didn't give me what I wanted and instead God did uh, what was most in line with the will of God. And so that is the first lesson I think that we should take away from this passage. The second lesson we should take away from the passage is this. God's grace is for everyone. God's grace is for everyone. And that is something that I know you're probably thinking to yourself, well, come on, Pastor Kerry, we all know that. We know that God's grace is for everyone. But I would just remind you that for Jonah, God's grace wasn't for everyone, was it? For Jonah, God's grace was for him. And God's grace, I'm assuming, was for uh, Jonah's fellow Hebrews. But Jonah did not want God's grace to be extended to the Ninevites. Probably, assumedly, because they were Gentiles. And so I think that most of us that live in this day and age, uh, that, that we have the luxury of understanding that God's grace is for everyone every single person all around the globe. We understand that, and that's what we want. 
and that's a good thing. That's why you and I are here today. That's why I am recording this video and I'm pretty sure that's why you're watching this video is because of God's grace and the fact that God's grace is for everyone because my background isn't Hebrew. <laughs> it, it would be great if it was, but, but my background isn't Hebrew. I'm not Jewish and I'm assuming that probably for the majority of the people watching this video, you're probably not Jewish in your background either. I'm sure, I'm sure that some are, but not all are. And so this is a good thing for us. That's why we're here is because God's grace is for everyone. And that leads to the final lesson we should take away from the passage. God's grace is for everyone and we should want everyone to receive God's grace. God's grace is for everyone and we should want everyone to receive God's grace. Because again, Jonah didn't want everyone to receive God's grace. He didn't want the Ninevites to receive God's grace. And you know what? I think it's easy for us now to say, yes, well, of course, I want everyone to receive God's grace. Of course, I want, I want everyone everywhere in the world. I want all of them to receive God's grace. And that's good. I'm glad that you would say that. But now let me ask you a tougher question. When you watch the news and there is that certain person on the news that you really don't like, do you want that person to receive God's grace? When you watch the news and there is this entire group of people that you don't like, do you want all of them to receive God's grace? Because again, like we talked about last week, God knows our hearts. God knows if I want everyone to receive God's grace or just the people that I like to receive God's grace. I think that's a question that you and I need to contend with. And hopefully we can get to the point where you and I can both say, I want everyone, even the people that I don't like, even the people on the news. I don't like that person. I don't like those people, but I want even them to receive God's grace. Hopefully you and I can get to that point. And of course, as I alluded to earlier, the reason <laughs> that you and I, most of us are watching this video today is because we are the recipients of that grace because God wanted everyone everywhere in the world to receive that grace. And we honor and we celebrate that every time we gather around the Lord's table. I just want to remind you of the Apostle Paul's words recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul said, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So right now, I want to invite you, as our time runs out, to grab your communion elements. And I'll go ahead and grab mine. And then I would invite you to partake with me so that we can partake together. The body of Christ, broken for us, we partake in remembrance of him. And the blood of Christ, shed for us, we drink in remembrance of him. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the fact that your grace is for all of us. All of us, all of us, 